Good morning and happy Easter. Welcome to Sunday School at Cedar Lane United Methodist Church. Um, today, we're reading from Matthew's story of Jesus' resurrection from the Gospel of Matthew, uh, chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. Last week's study of the uh, Last Supper inspired me to read the accounts in all four Gospels as one would expect from four different reporters, certain things were included in all four gospels and some were only in John. The harmony of the gospels found in the NIV Bible provides a convenient list if you wanna look that up. All four gospels included the identification of Jesus' betrayer, the prediction of Peter's denial, and Jesus' agonizing prayer in Gethsemane. However, only John includes Jesus washing the disciples' feet, the discussion of his destination of the Father and the Holy Spirit, the coming of the Holy Spirit and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and Jesus' prayer for himself, the disciples, and all who believe. Jesus told them during the Passover meal he was about to die. However, he also told them that he would meet them in Galilee after he had risen. Matthew, which is in Matthew 26, 32. Which statement do you think grabbed their attention the most? Which statement would have flooded your emotions? That night was not the first time he had told them that he was going to die. In Luke 9.22, after Peter made his wonderful proclamation to say that Jesus was the Christ of God, right after that, Jesus told them that he must suffer and die and be raised on the third day. There were other times made, this statement was made to them his resurrection should have been expected. The disciples should have been waiting with bated breath to see what would happen. That's real easy to say from our perspective. What happened to them happens to all of us when faced with a situation where all we see is negative. To them, Jesus was dead. That is the end of the story. Their minds focused on that and they forgot about the promise. Um, in the upper room devotional on Wednesday, uh, it was about the author of that particular devotion going mountain biking for the first time. And I found this whole principle kind of interesting. Her teacher mentioned something called target fixation and how it is an issue with mountain bikers. Simply put, if she focused or fixed her sight on the rock in the middle of the path, she would hit it and get thrown from the bike. But if she looked down the path, she would still be able to see the rock and avoid it, go around it. The disciples seem to have been in this position, fixed on Jesus' death. Their focus was all about that and they did not remember what he had said about the resurrection. In other words, they were not looking down the path. All of this is far easier said than done in the midst of our lives. Someone in the family looks at us the wrong way. We don't get the respect we think we deserve. We get a sobering medical diagnosis. Someone dies. The, ha the fight we have as Christians is not with the world and the things that happen around us or even to us. 
It's not with our siblings or our parents or our spouse or family, the family of God, our fellow church members, or people in general. The fight we have is for control of our minds. Have you noticed that when things happen, how our thoughts just want to run wild and make all kinds of accusations and defenses? I'm guilty, I know it. The fix is to look down the road. Take the focus off ourselves and remind ourselves of what God in Christ has promised to us. Paul in Philippians 4, 4 through 7, makes this exhortation. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious for anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Peace in the middle of turmoil is the promise, but we have to look to God. That peace will put a hedge around our hearts and our minds. That brings our emotions back under control. Emotions are just emotions. It's all they are. They can be brought under control. Um, and that happens as we worship and love our Lord. Okay, so let's look at the scriptures for today. Enough introduction. <laughs> After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. Uh, remind, I have to remind myself, so I'm going to remind you too. The Sabbath was from Friday sundown until Saturday sundown. Now, Mark's gospel tells us that the other Mary was the mother of James and Joseph, Joseph or Joseph is it's J O S E S, but it's really a shortened version of Joseph. Mark also lists Salome as among the women. Luke adds Joanna. As I read Mark, it talked about the women going and buying spices to prepare so they could wrap Jesus' body in them. So kind of re get, remember that Sabbath thing? I have to remind myself that Sabbath was over Saturday evening. The shops could buy and sell again. That's why they could go and buy the spices. So the Jews did not embalm people like the the, he, the Egyptians did. They just wrapped them in the spices as a sign of the love and devotion. The same reminder for from the Sunday morning. There was no problem with them to be out before daylight. The Sabbath was over. Um, while they're on their way, Mark has them asking each other, who will roll away the stone? It was too heavy for them to move. Looking was all they could have done. Now, let me explain. I read a little article by Ray Vanderlaan about the garden tomb. And he explained that the wheel would have been about five feet in diameter. Not so bad, shorter than I am. Not quite as tall as my sister, who's 5'3", taller than my mother, who was 4'11". So about five feet. But it was about 12 inches thick and weighed about 4,000 pounds. Oh, let me put one more little caveat in there. In the track that it rolled in, right at the bottom where it needed to sit just to cover the grade, they made a little dip. So that when they rolled it, it rolled into the dip and went boom. So now you've got to move 4,000 pounds out of this dip to get it going. The four women could not have moved that. 
I'm not saying they were weak. I'm just saying it's going to take something to move this rock. There was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. Now, each of the Gospels is slightly different at this point, but all four report that the tomb was empty, found empty, by, the tomb was found empty by the women. Luke and John both report that Peter and John came later and confirmed what the women had seen. I know it's been said before, but the angel didn't open the grave to let Jesus out. He had already risen. He opened it, the grave, to let the women and Peter and John in to be witnesses of to what God had done in raising Jesus from the dead. It was the way of proving that. Now, my mind has a picture of the angel just kind of rolling back the stone, putting a chalk to keep it in place, and then sitting on top of it. Now, that's cute, but I'm not sure that it's accurate. After all, there was an earthquake. For all I know, that rock was flung out of the way, was laid over on its side, and the angel was sitting there stretched out on the side of that stone. We don't know. We know he was sitting on the stone. We don't know where the stone was. Um, notice the description of the angel. Appearance like lightning, clothes white as snow. And that was the description of Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter and James and John were up there and saw, when they saw it, they were awestruck. Now put yourself in the guard's shoes. They had never seen anything like this and they just passed out. Pure and simple, they passed out. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples. He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. Don't be afraid. That was the angel's word to the women. The angel knew why they were there to see Jesus. They were looking for him. But his message to them was the, said the same thing Jesus said. He's not dead. He's, a, he's arisen. He's going to meet you in Galilee. Go tell the disciples that he's going to meet you in Galilee. So the, the interesting part about this is the, the two things that went together. The fearful, joyful women doing as they were told, going to tell the disciples what they had seen, when unexpectedly they meet the risen Christ. He repeated the command to not be afraid and to tell my brothers, the disciples, that they would see him in Galilee. Notice that, it's brothers. The disciples are not servants, they're not pupils, they're family. And so all who believe in Christ are family. I love what John 3, 1, 1 John 3, 1 says, see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. It took the blood of Jesus to pay the price for the sin of all mankind. Through that sacrifice, all who believe are set free from sin. With Jesus' resurrection, we too are reborn. Our spirits pass from death 
to life. They are recreated. We can look down the path with confidence that we will live forever with him in heaven. And whatever bumps we may experience here on earth can never take away that promise. God doesn't expect us to be perfect when we come to him. He wants us to believe in him and seek him and leave the rest to him. He will teach us his ways. And if we believe, we will please God. If we seek him with sincere and intense conviction, if we are serious, he rewards us. That means it doesn't mean we don't have questions or doubts. It means that we are honest in our searching. Hebrews 11.6 puts it this way. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Thank God for Christ. Thank God that he walks with us through all of our life and that we will live with him forever and ever. I hope you have a happy Easter and we hope to see you next week.